get this bill uh, passed. The president will emphasize his job bill in his press conference at 11 a.m., live coverage on cspan.org. Thank you very much to Congresswoman Barbara Lee for being our second and final guest this morning. Please come back. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. And to our viewers, now to the House of Representatives. Today. Once again, we come to ask wisdom, patience, peace, and understanding for the members of this people's house. The words and sentiments that have been spoken and heard in these recent days were born of principle, conviction, and commitment. We ask discernment for the members that they might judge anew their adherence to principle, conviction, and commitment, lest they slide uncharitably toward an inability to listen to one another and work cooperatively to solve the important issues of our day. Give them the generosity of heart and the courage of true leadership to work toward a common solution with sacrifice on both sides. We pray that their work results not in a nation comprised of winners and losers, but where our citizens know in their hearts that we Americans are all winners. May all that is done this day be for your greater honor and glory. Amen. The chair has examined the journal of the last day's proceedings and announces to the House's approval thereof, pursuant to Clause 1 of Rule 1, the journal stands approved. Pledge of Allegiance today will be led by the gentleman from Rhode Island, uh, Mr. Cicilline. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Chair will entertain up to five one-minute requests on each side. For what purpose does the gentleman from Texas rise? Without objection, so ordered. Mr. Speaker, walking home from school, a girl of 12 is approached by a man who promises to give her everything. In her short life, she has already suffered abuse and neglect from her father and her foster parents. She thinks the promise of food and shelter and love is something she cannot pass up. But the man takes the girl to a hotel room where he beats her, forces her to do drugs, and rapes her. Then she is sold on the Internet and taken from hotel to hotel around the country and regularly raped by multiple men and treated as a piece of property. She becomes a sex slave. This is the plight of an actual domestic minor sex trafficking victim in the United States. We cannot continue to be blissfully ignorant of this crime against these victims. As co-chair of the Victims' Rights Caucus, along with Jim Costa, I commend the work of Carolyn Maloney and Chris Smith for their legislation to help stop this scourge of child trafficking. These children need to be rescued and treated as victims, not criminals. And the customers and the traffickers need to be arrested, tried before a jury of 12, and get their just rewards for having been involved in the sex slave trafficking. And that's just the way it is. For what purpose does the gentleman from Rhode Island rise? Without objection. Without objection. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to recognize the superintendent of the North Providence, Rhode Island School Department, Donna Ottaviano, who is honored as the Rhode Island Superintendent of the Year by the Rhode Island School Superintendents Association. Dr. Toviano, who has also attended North Providence High School as a student, has led the North Providence Public Schools with distinction since 2004. Dr. Toviano has spent nearly 30 years in the education field as a teacher, principal, assistant superintendent, and public health educator in my home state of Rhode Island. In addition to the tremendous contribution she's made to Rhode Island's education system, she's also devoted her time to breast cancer awareness, as well as lending her support to the Rhode Island Special Olympics. Dr. Ottaviano will be recognized nationally at the annual American Association of School Administrators National Conference on Education. In addition, a $1,000 scholarship in Dr. Ottaviano's name will be awarded to a senior from North Providence High School. I congratulate and commend Dr. Ottaviano for her dedication and commitment to educating the future of Rhode Island. And I yield back the balance of my time. For what purpose, gentlemen from Texas rise? Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
You know, the president wants the Congress to pass this $447 billion jobs plan. It really ought to be called son of stimulus. Yet more spending and higher taxes, as the president's jobs plan proposes, won't get our economy moving in the right direction. It's just the same act, different day. It's time for our tax and spender in chief to stop pushing these failed policies, start listening to the American people. With unemployment above 9%, we need to get Americans back to work by stopping out of control spending, reforming our tax code, and putting an end to the senseless job killing regulations of this administration. Jobs are there. One example let's just drill for oil and gas. We simply cannot tax, spend, and borrow our way to prosperity. Yield back. What purpose does the gentleman from Minnesota rise? Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to let folks know that the American can-do spirit and the spirit of innovation is alive and well in southern Minnesota. Last week, I visited a United Machine and Foundry in Winona, Minnesota. UMF is a small business that opened in 1885. It currently employs 35 people and produces metal castings for asphalt production, road construction, and power generation. UMF President Tom Rank told me the only real problem he has is this. Without investment in critical infrastructure like roads, the foundry doesn't sell any products. When demand dries up, so do the jobs. Building things is in the American DNA. We build roads, we build bridges, we create necessary infrastructure to power this economy. Congress has the tools to build again. We have a president prepared to break ground. We can create the infrastructure our grandchildren will need in the 21st century. I visited UMF of Winona to remind myself that building things is in our DNA. Building things is the American spirit. That spirit will create jobs and it will build the economy we need in the 21st century. Thank you and I yield back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Virginia rise? Without objection. Mr. Speaker, I rise today on behalf of the Congressional Prayer Caucus to note the importance of prayer in the founding of our country. This week in 1791, John Hancock, a signer of the Declaration of Independence and the governor of Massachusetts, issued a proclamation declaring a day of public thanksgiving. John Hancock said in part, I thought fit to appoint a day of public thanksgiving and praise to Almighty God for all His goodness towards us. Above all, not only to continue to us the enjoyment of our civil rights and liberties, but the great and most important blessing, the gospel of Jesus Christ. I do earnestly recommend that we may join the penitent confession of our sins and implore the further continuance of the divine protection and blessings of heaven upon this people especially that he would be graciously pleased to direct and prosper the administration of the federal government and of the other states in the Union, to bless the allies of the United States and to afford his almighty aid to all people who are virtuous, virtuously struggling for the rights of men so that universal happiness may be established in the world, that all may bow to the scepter of our Lord Jesus Christ and the whole earth be filled with his glory. Mr. Speaker, I yield back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Ohio rise? Without objection. Yes, Mr. Speaker, some pundits are criticizing the Wall Street demonstrators as unfocused, inchoate, and disorganized. Well, let me render this opinion. It is Congress that is unfocused, inchoate, and disorganized. It is Congress that has not met its obligation to the American people. Congress has not addressed the real damage caused by Wall Street greed. This institution can't even do rigorous oversight hearings across America, starting on Wall Street. The demonstrators have found the right piece of geography. They have their eyes on the right subject. It is this body that has allowed justice to be denied to millions of our fellow Americans harmed by Wall Street wrongdoers. Wall Street's taken bonuses as we've seen the largest transfer of wealth from Main Street to Wall Street in modern history. Too much power in too few hands. I'm placing in the record today 12 bills Congress needs to pass to yield long overdue justice, restore a trustworthy competitive banking system, and get the big money out of politics influencing this Congress. These bills include restoring Glass-Steagall, helping those facing foreclosure, and adding 1,000 FBI agents to do real investigation and prosecution along with forensic accounting to bring those who have done wrong to this republic to justice. I yield back my remaining time. 
For what purpose does the gentleman from Indiana rise? It's unanimous consent to address the House for one minute, revising the same amount of money. Without objection. You know, in the midst of these rancorous and divided days in our nation's capital, there is a growing consensus across this country that Washington, D.C. isn't just broke, it's broken. With a $14 trillion national debt, the American people want solutions, not fights. They want reforms that will transcend political parties and the historic divides that have made this city uh, seem for most Americans to appear to be a house divided. Well, thanks to tough negotiations this summer, the American people deserve to know that Congress has a historic opportunity to vote on just such a bipartisan solution. It's a balanced budget amendment to the Constitution of the United States. For the first time in 15 years, the House and the Senate will have an up or down vote on this historic measure, and every American who is fed up with borrowing and spending and deficits and debt should let their voice be heard and be heard today. Most Americans work hard. They pay their bills and they live within their means. I think it's time we had a national government as good as our people. It's time to pass a balanced budget amendment to the Constitution, send it from this House to the Senate, and from this Congress to the states for ratification. For what purpose the gentleman from Delaware rise? Without objection, the gentleman is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, last week I sponsored a job fair in my home state of Delaware in Georgetown. The good news is that nearly 2,000 people turned out to meet 55 employers, some of which who had jobs for them. The bad news is that so many people out there are looking for work. Thousands of people in Delaware and millions across the country are looking for work. Mr. Speaker, it's time we vote a jobs bill here in the House of Representatives. The President set up the American Jobs Act. It contains infrastructure investments on roads, highways, and schools. It contains tax cuts for small businesses. These are things that we could all agree on here in Congress, and they will help businesses create the jobs that people need right, right away in our districts. It's time we do what the people sent us here to do in Washington. It's time to pass a jobs bill here in the House of Representatives. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield back. For what purpose the gentleman from Arizona rise? Without objection, the gentleman is recognized for one minute. Today I would like to recognize Barbara Mickelson, a very special woman and a hometown hero doing extraordinary work for our military veterans in Prescott, Arizona. Barbara joined the U.S. Vets in 2004 and has led their effort to provide affordable housing, quality health care, and job training to the homeless veterans of the Quad Cities of Northern Arizona. Nationally, U.S. Vets feed, clothe, shelter, and help get back to work over 2,000 veterans every year. As the Prescott Site Director for the U.S. Vets, the largest service provider for the homeless veterans in the United States, Barbara was awarded the 2011 National Award for Site Director of the Year. Additionally, the Arizona Department of Veterans Services recognized Barb with an award of recognition and appreciation. Barb has proven herself a dedicated and inspiring advocate. I applaud her for going above and beyond the call of duty. I congratulate her and am proud of the wonderful service to our military men and women in Arizona's 1st Congressional District. I challenge others to follow her exemplary leadership and give back to their community in this time of great national need. I yield back. For what purpose is the gentlewoman from uh, California? Without objection, the gentleman is re recognized for one minute. Thank you. Um, Mr. Speaker, I rise today to speak in support of our service members and their families. For the last 10 years, our vo all volunteer force has graciously and without complaint done all we have asked of them. They have deployed many more than once, leaving their families and friends here at home to go fight on foreign soil. And today, during this time of budget constraints and upcoming cuts, we must remember the sacrifice our servicemen and women, as well as their families, have made. We cannot balance our budget by cutting the benefits they have earned and deserve. <clears throat> I agree that all aspects of government spending must be looked at and considered for possible cuts. In this era where our budget is so out of balance, no entity can be spared. However, we have to make smart cuts and ensure that our fighting men and women are taken care of. We need to look at weapons programs that no longer meet our needs, redundancies that can be streamlined, and other programs that should be more efficient. 
I encourage my colleagues on the Super Committee to fight for our brave men and women by protecting the benefits they so rightly deserve. I yield back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Alabama rise? Uh, Mr. Speaker, due to a clerical error, I was inadvertently made a co-sponsor on the wrong bill. As such, I ask unanimous consent to remove myself as a co-sponsor of H.R. 2954. Without objection. For what purpose does the gentleman from Kentucky rise? Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that all members may have five legislative days to revise and extend their remarks on the legislation and to insert extraneous materials on H.R. 2250. Without objection. Pursuant to House Resolution 419 and Rule 18, the Chair declares the House and the Committee of the Whole House on the State of the Union for consideration of H.R. 2250. The Chair appoints the gentleman from California, Mr. Denham, to preside over the Committee of the Whole. The House is in the Committee of the Whole on the State of the Union for the consideration of H.R. 2250, which the Clerk will report by title. A bill to provide additional time for the administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency to issue achievable standards for industrial, commercial, and institutional boilers, process heaters, and incinerators, and for other purposes. Pursuant to the rule, the bill is considered read the first time. The gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Whitfield, and the gentleman from California, Mr. Waxman, each will control 30 minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Kentucky. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I yield myself as much time as I may consume. Without objection. Since 2009, the Environmental Protection Agency has, has rolled out a long list of regulations that are really unprecedented in their cost and complexity. The impacts on jobs, energy prices, and America's industrial competitiveness in the world are extremely serious. But of all these rules, the Boiler Mac rule, which we will be discussing today, stands out in that it will apply to a very wide variety of employers. Not only will industrial facilities be impacted, but also colleges, universities, hospitals, government buildings, and large commercial pro properties. The impact on jobs projected is staggering. But the cost will be borne by all of us in the form of higher tuition costs, higher hospital bills, higher rent, as well as higher prices for manufactured goods. Just about everyone will be adversely impacted either directly or indirectly. The good news is that we can reduce emissions from boilers without causing economic harm. The EPA Regulatory Relief Act, H.R. 2250, accomplishes this goal by taking a sensible, middle ground, balanced approach. And I would like at this time to thank Mr. Butterfield of North Carolina, as well as Mr. Griffith of Virginia, for their sponsorship of this bipartisan bill. A study conducted by IHS Global Insight a respected research company, found that the rules that we are talking about today would impose total cost of over $14 billion and put at risk 230,000 jobs in America at a time when we already have a 9.1 unemployment rate. My home state of Kentucky, under the analysis, would face estimated cost of $183 million and 2,930 potential job losses. Twenty-five other states are hit even harder. That includes at least 10,000 jobs estimated for North Carolina losing, Indiana, Ohio, Michigan, Pennsylvania, South Carolina, and Virginia as well as over 5,000 job losses for Minnesota, Wisconsin, Alabama, Tennessee, Iowa, New York, Illinois, Maine, Georgia, Florida, Louisiana, and Arkansas. 
These boiler rules largely target also coal-fired boilers and thus discourage the use of this energy source, which by the way today provides about 51% 50 of all the electricity produced in America. I should add that the problems with EPA boiler rules are not the sole fault of the agency. These rules, like many today, are being rushed out the door to comply with a court-ordered deadline. EPA asked for additional time, but their request was re refused by the courts. EPA then published the rules by the deadline, but immediately announced that it was reconsidering portions of them uh, because they were so complicated. However, this is not an adequate solution as the reconsideration only applies to some of the many problematic provisions in these rules. And the reconsideration process is an uncertain one. In reality, it is unlikely that all the issues can be addressed. So our legislation is to help EPA deal with this problem. We create a comprehensive solution not only for EPA, but also for boiler owners, and we provide the certainty that this solution will be implemented. It still requires additional emission reductions from boilers, but it gives EPA the time it needs to do it right. It gives the regulated community the time it needs in order to comply. Now, this bill is supported by over 300 organizations and five national labor unions. It will require that the standards be reasonable and take into account cost and achievability under real world conditions. I believe that EPA's original rules were a departure from the congressional intent in the Clean Air Act and the EPA Regulatory Relief Act that we're discussing today represents a return to congressional intent. Make no mistake, under this bill that we're discussing, new standards will be imposed on boiler owners and operators. The goals of the Clean Air Act can be accomplished without undue cost and job losses, particularly at this time in our nation's economy when we're struggling. However, the EPA Regulatory Relief Act is, is the way to do it. So I would urge every member of this body to come forth today and help us pass this legislation, help us save over 230,000 jobs at risk in America that we can ill afford to lose with this balanced approach to the problem. So with that, uh, I would like to retain the balance of my time. Thank you. The gentleman reserves his time. The gentleman from California is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I uh, yield myself five minutes. Today's debate is going to seem awfully uh, familiar to anyone that's been paying attention. Today's debate will remind us of the bill we passed in April to block any requirements to control carbon pollution and the bill we passed in June to loosen pollution controls on oil companies and the bill we passed in September to gut the Clean Air Act and block pollution controls on power plants and the bill we debated yesterday to ensure cement kilns don't have to clean up their toxic air pollution. In total, the House has voted 146 times this Congress to block action to change climate change, to halt efforts to reduce air and water pollution, to undermine protections for public lands and coastal areas, and to weaken the protection of the environment in other ways. This is the most anti-environment Congress in history. Today, the House continues its frontal assault on public health and the environment. The bill we consider today would nullify and indefinitely delay EPA's efforts to reduce toxic emissions from industrial boilers and waste incinerators. If this bill is enacted, there will be more cases of cancer, birth defects, and brain damage. The ability of our children to think and learn will be impaired because of their exposure to mercury and other dangerous air pollutants. In 1990, Congress adopted a bipartisan approach to protect the public from toxic substances. The law directed EPA to set standards 
requiring the use of the maximum achievable control technology to control emissions of mercury, arsenic, dioxin, PCBs, and other toxic emissions. This approach has worked well. Industrial emissions of carcinogens and other highly toxic chemicals have been reduced by 1.7 million tons each year. EPA has reduced pollution from dozens of industrial sectors. More than 100 categories of sources have been required to cut their pollution, and this has delivered major public health benefits to the nation. But a few large source categories still have not been required to control toxic air pollution due to delays and litigation. Now that pollution controls are finally being required on industrial boilers and waste incinerators, this bill would intervene and delay pollution controls indefinitely. It would also rewrite the standards. It would, under, it would rewrite the standard setting provisions in the Clean Air Act to weaken the level of protection and set up new hurdles for EPA rules. We're told that this bill simply gives the EPA the time they requested to get the rules right. Well, the EPA has not requested this from Congress, and the President has said he'll veto this bill if it gets to his desk. We're also told that we need to pass these bills because the threat of EPA regulation is down, dragging down our economy. The reality is that requiring installation of pollution controls will create jobs. Fabricators and factory workers build the controls, the pollution controls. Construction workers install them on site, and industry employees operate them. We'll hear over and over today, as we've heard in the past, about self-serving industry studies that claim pollution controls will cost us jobs. These studies have been thoroughly debunked by independent experts. For instance, the Congressional Research Service examined the key study by the Council of Industrial Boiler Owners and concluded that it was so flawed that, quote, little credence can be placed in these estimate, uh, estimate of job losses, end quote. It's my hope this body will not be so easily misled. It was a lack of regulation of Wall Street banks that caused this recession, not environmental regulations that protect children from toxic mercury emissions. I oppose these bills on the substance, but I also have concerns about the process as well. When Congress organized in the beginning of the year, the majority leader announced that the House would be following a discretionary cut-go rule. Similarly, Chairman Upton on our committee stated that he'd be following that same discretionary cut-go rule. Well, CBO has determined that the bill we consider today authorizes new discretionary spending and will have significant impact on the federal budget. However, this new authorization, I yield myself an additional 30 seconds. This new authorization is not offset, and the bill does not comply with the Republicans' discretionary cut-go policy. It is not discretionary in the sense they, can, they have discretion whether to follow it or not, but discretionary spending, when it's mandated in a bill, must be paid for. The American people need to focus on the radical agenda of the Republicans that control the House of Representatives. I don't think when the Republicans were voted into office, the American people wanted poisoning more children with mercury, letting more of our seniors die prematurely because of uncontrolled air pollution. I reserve the balance of our time. Gentleman reserves. Gentleman from Kentucky is recognized. Yes, at this time I would like to uh, yield uh, two and a half minutes to the distinguished gentleman from Ohio, a member of the Energy and Commerce Committee, Mr. Latta. The gentleman from Ohio is recognized for two and a half minutes. I thank the gentleman for yielding the speaker. I rise today in support of H.R. 2250. I'm a co-sponsor of this legislation, which was introduced in response to yet another overreaching EPA rule proposal, this time for industrial boilers. This rule, finalized, will have devastating effects on the nation's economy and lead to further job loss, especially in my home state of Ohio. The community of Oroville, Ohio, which is east of me, a small city which just has just over 8,300 residents, provides a perfect example of the wide-ranging negative impacts of the rule. 
As written, the Boiler Mac rule would require Orville Utilities, a nonprofit electric service provider, to spend $40.2 million in additional controls to remain in compliance. This equates to $4,843 for every man, woman, and child living in Orville, as well as putting the utility workers' jobs at risk. While that cost alone would be devastating to the families and job creators in, in the community, the unintended consequences reach much deeper. For example, Smuckers, that company that we all know and love, which makes jellies, jams, apple butter spreads, and other food products, have been a staple of America's homes for over 110 years, employs over 1,500 people at its home uh, factories in Oroville. Smucker has been a, consume, a customer of the Oroville Utilities since the establishment of the utility in 1917, and the company's CEO said Smucker has elected to remain in the Oroville, Ohio community for many reasons, including the low rates, reliable service, and the company benefits of working with a city-owned and operated electric utility. It is impossible for me to understand why anyone would support a rule that forces a nonprofit utility like Orville's to significantly raise their rates as the result of a rule EPA has admitted was based on faulty information and make it more difficult for companies that have been providing thousands of jobs in communities like Orville for over 110 years to do business. It is important to note that this bill does not ask the EPA not to regulate these facilities. It only lays out framework that allows the EPA to regulate them in a more reasonable fashion over a more reasonable time frame so that we can protect the environment and take advantage of all the economic benefits that these facilities provide to the communities and businesses they service. Mr. Speaker, I urge my colleagues to support this important job-saving legislation. And I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, before I recognize the subcommittee chairman, I want to indicate to the gentleman from Ohio that just spoke, Mr. Latta, that he was uh, giving a, a speech on the wrong rule that this bill does not pertain to the rule that he uh, mentioned in his comments. Uh, I now want to yield five minutes to the gentleman from, uh, from Illinois, the distinguished ranking member of the subcommittee on energy and the environment. The gentleman from Illinois is recognized for five minutes. I want to thank uh, my uh, um, leader, uh, the ranking member of the full committee, for yielding uh, this time to me. And uh, Mr. Speaker, I rise today in strong opposition to H.R. 2250, the Dirty Mauler Enhancement and Enabler Bill. Mr. Speaker, here we go again. And this bill represents yet another Republican unrestrained, unrestricted assault on the Clean Air Act and our nation's most fundamental environmental protection laws. In fact, since the new Republican majority has taken over, there's been a constant assault against the Environmental Protection Agency and the clean air policies that they enforce on behalf of a few of the most avaricious, opportunistic, and dirtiest uh, polluters uh, ever known in the history of mankind and to the detriment of the American public as a whole. Since the new Tea Party-led majority has taken control of this Congress, this body has passed bill after bill that will weaken our nation's most basic clean air and clean water regulations. One of the very first bills that this new radical Republican majority passed out of the Energy and Commerce Committee, H.R. 910, was a direct frontal attack on the EPA's ability to even regulate greenhouse gas emissions uh, at all, despite the warnings and evidence from those in the scientific community that these gases directly contribute to climate change. Last month, the radical Republican majority followed that up with H.R. 2401, the Train Wreck Act, which will repeal and block smog, soot, mercury, and air toxics standards for power plants 
that will potentially save thousands of lives and avoid hundreds of thousands of asthma attacks in this nation. Now, here we are today debating H.R. 2250, the Dirty Boiler Enhancement and Enabler Bill, which will vacate three Clean Air Act rules that establishes the only national limits on emissions of air toxins, including mercury, from certain boilers and incinerators. This bill will require EPA to propose and finalize weaker alternative rules that will allow for more pollution than the law currently permits by intentionally making substantial changes in how the EPA sets the standards for the rules. At a minimum, this dirty boiler enabler and enhancement bill will delay EPA reductions for boilers and incinerators until at least 2018, which is a three-year delay. Mr. Speaker, the science tells us that these dirty air toxins can cause a variety of serious health effects, including cancer, respiratory and neuro neurological impairments, as well as reproductive problems. The research also tells us that low-income families and minorities are disproportionately affected by toxic air pollution, including impaired neurological development, as well as higher rates of respiratory and cardiovascular disease because these groups are more likely to live closer to industrial power plant facilities. In fact, by the EPA's own estimate, HR, HR 2250 will allow up to tens of thousands of additional premature deaths and heart attacks and hundreds of thousands of additional asthma attacks uh, that could have been avoided. 30, 30 they yield another 30 seconds. M Mr. Speaker, <coughs> it is time, it is now time that the re radical Republican majority stop putting uh, profits in the pockets of dirty polluters and stop putting dirty air in the lungs of the American people. Mr. Speaker, now is the time for the Republicans to cease their uh, unending assault on the Environmental Protection Agency. Mr. Speaker, I urge all my colleagues to oppose this egregious and da dangerous bill, and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Kentucky is recognized. At this time, I'd like to yield uh, four minutes to the primary sponsor of the legislation, Mr. Griffith of Virginia, a member of the Energy and Commerce Committee. The gentleman from Virginia is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I rise today in support of H.R. 2250, the EPA Regulatory Relief Act of 2011. Excessive regulations are threatening jobs across the nation. We all recognize the need for reasonable regulations to protect the public. There are good regulations that ensure public safety and protect our environment. But there are also unnecessary and unreasonable regulations that hurt jobs in some of our nation's most critical industries. Recently, a representative from Selenese, a chemical company in the 9th District of Virginia, which I'm proud to represent, testified that the EPA's Boiler Mac rules, as written, could force them to significantly scale back or change operations at a plant in Giles County that employs hundreds of people in the 9th District. Giles County and communities throughout southwest Virginia are already facing job losses resulting from other excessive EPA regulations. The Boiler Mac rules are a very complex area of law and regulation. We are talking about hundreds of pages of rules in the Federal Register. These rules would affect boilers used by thousands of major employers and smaller employers, including hospitals, manufacturers, and even our colleges. By the EPA's own estimates, compliance with its Boiler Mac rules will impose $5.8 billion in upfront cap capital costs and impose new costs of $2.2 billion annually. However, the Council of Industrial Boiler Owners estimates that the capital costs alone of the final rules will exceed $14 billion and could put more than 230,000 jobs at risk 
including 10,000 jobs in Virginia. The EPA Regulatory Relief Act would provide the EPA with 15 months to repropose and finalize new, achievable, and workable rules to replace those that were published earlier this year. The legislation would extend the compliance deadlines from three to at least five years to allow facilities like Selenese and others enough time to comply with these very complex and expensive standards and to install the necessary equipment. It also directs the EPA to ensure that new rules are in fact achievable by real world boilers, process heaters, and incinerators and directs the EPA to impose the least burdensome regulatory alternatives under the Clean Air Act consistent with the Act and President Obama's executive order. Despite what opponents may say, this bill recognizes the need for reasonable boiler regulations. This is not an attempt to forego the rules entirely. Under H.R. 2250, the EPA must issue replacement rules and must set compliance dates. The bill simply provides sufficient time for the government to get the rules right and come up with a more reasonable and achievable approach that protects the public without imposing unnecessary costs in, business that in businesses that employ thousands of hardworking Americans. Protecting jobs is an issue that transcends party lines. This common sense bill represents a compromise. Like any compromise, the language of H.R. 2250 is not what I might have done if I were acting alone. However, this bill brought together a group of legislators from both sides of the aisle with a reasonable approach and reasonable language. The EPA Regulatory Relief Act has, has bipartisan 126 co-sponsors. America's job creators are also speaking out in support of this bill. The EPA Regulatory Relief Act has received hundreds of support letters from businesses, unions, and trade associations understand the in, uh, that understand the investment required by these rules are irreversible. For those businesses that decide to stop producing their product at a particular location, the job losses are also irreversible. The good news here is excessive regulations are reversible and fixable. We must fix unreasonable regulations like the Boiler Mac rules and keep the focus on protecting valuable American jobs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We yield you some additional time. Uh, Ten seconds ought to do it. I'll, I'll yield the gentleman 30 more seconds. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I urge all of my colleagues to join me in supporting the EPA Regulatory Relief Act of 2011. I appreciate uh, this opportunity to carry this important legislation which will protect jobs not only in the Ninth District of, Virgi of Virginia, but across these United States, and I yield back my time. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from Kentucky Reserves. Gentleman from California is recognized. Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, at this time I wish to yield five minutes to the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Markey. The gentleman from Massachusetts is recognized for five minutes. Thank you. I thank our leader from California. And uh, I just want to say that these bills represent a toxic assault that compromises public health for polluter wealth. Republicans are continuing their war on the environment with episode 37 of the Clean Air Act repeal-a-thon. It is a tried and true three-part Republican strategy. First, pass legislation that repeals regulations that have already been set. Second, indefinitely delay new regulations from ever being set. And third, just for good measure, include a provision that eviscerates the very underpinnings of effective federal law and deters any effort to protect the health and well-being of millions of Americans. Make no mistake, that is what we are doing here this week. These bills block and indefinitely delay implementation of the rules that would reduce hazardous air pollution, such as mercury, lead, and cancer-causing substances released from cement kilns and industrial boilers, and do so in callous disregard for adverse impacts those pollutants have on public health, particularly on the health of infants and children. 
Republicans have decided to stage their own public event today on the floor. Occupy Stall Street. But lest you think that Republicans always want to delay regulations, it turns out that sometimes they want to speed up the wheels. Republicans voted to tell EPA to hurry up and make decisions to issue air permits for drilling rigs off the pristine coast of Alaska. Republicans have voted to give the Department of Interior a mere 30 days to approve permit applications for drilling in the Gulf at the same time they block legislation to implement any drilling reform in the wake of the BP disaster. And have also voted to reduce the time allowed for environmental review so that the State Department would approve the Keystone Pipeline as soon as possible. But when it comes to regulations that would decrease the amount of toxic pollutants in our air or water, apparently the same federal agencies that evaluate hazardous pollutants in the first place just need more time to review the science, more time to understand the technologies, more time before doing anything to make our water safer to drink, make our air safer to breathe, and protect the health of children around the country. And it also turns out that Republicans don't always turn a blind eye towards the health effects of toxic chemicals. Three months ago, as our country stood on the edge of default due to Tea Party brinksmanship, House Republicans chose to vigorously debate a bill to ban compact fluorescent light bulbs. During that debate, Republicans repeatedly told us that the mercury vapor from those light bulbs is dangerous and that exposing our citizens to the harmful effects of the mercury contained and CFL light bulbs is likely to pose a hazard for years to come. Yet, the bills considered today would result in nearly 16,600 pounds of extra mercury vapors being released directly into the air, and that's just in one year. That is the equivalent of two and a half billion compact fluorescent light bulbs. And the mercury released as a result of these bills is not the kind you can sweep off the living room floor or throw into a trash can. This is the mercury released directly into the air that we all breathe and finds its way into the food that we eat. If the regulation to remove mercury from cement plants, which is already 13 years overdue, is delayed for even one year, up to 2,500 people will die prematurely. There will be 17,000 cases of aggravated asthma, and the 1,500 people will suffer heart attacks. If the regulation to remove mercury, lead, and cancer-causing toxins from incinerators and industrial boilers, which is already... Get up 30, okay. I thank the gentleman. If the regulation to remove mercury, lead, and cancer-causing toxins from incinerators and industrial boilers, which is already 11 years overdue, is delayed for even one year, there will be 6,000 600 people who will die prematurely, and people will miss 320,000 days of work and school. The Republicans are presenting yet another false choice to the American people. We do not have to choose between manufacturing and mercury. We do not have to choose between concrete and cancer. We can have both clean air and a healthy manufacturing sector. I urge my colleagues to vote no on this terrible Republican cancer-causing bill out here on the floor today. I would continue to reserve our time. General reserves. General Kentucky is recognized. I might just note to the gentleman from Massachusetts that our legislation does not postpone this indefinitely. Uh, EPA has 15 months after passage of the bill to come out with the regulations and five years to comply, and the only r way they can e be extended beyond five years is if the EPA administrator herself decides to do so. 
At this time, I would like to yield to the gentleman from Georgia, Dr. Gingry, a member of the committee, uh, two and one half minutes. The gentleman from Georgia is recognized for two and a half minutes. Mr. Chairman, I rise in strong support of H.R. 2250, the EPA Regulatory Relief Act of 2011. This important legislation will greatly reduce the onerous regulatory burden caused by what is commonly referred to as Boiler Mac the Boiler Mac rule that has been proposed by the EPA. Furthermore, I commend the sponsors of the bill and fellow members of the Energy and Commerce Committee, Chairman Whitfield, Mr. Griffith of Virginia, and Mr. Butterfield of North Carolina for their leadership on this important issue. Unfortunately, the Boiler Mac rule has the potential to cost a broad base of industries a total of nearly $14.4 billion in compliance costs and it could jeopardize upwards of 225,000 jobs. In my home state of Georgia alone, <clears throat> the Boiler Mac rule would put nearly 6,400 jobs at risk. At a time when 14 million Americans are out of work, we need to take the necessary steps to prevent adding even more people to these unemployment roles. Mr. Chairman, H.R. 2250 would simply delay this rule by 15 months in order to insert much needed common sense into this rulemaking process. By providing this important delay, there will be ample, ample time for the EPA to craft rules that will take into account the economic impact of these regulations and to provide industries with the needed time for their implementation. This has the potential of creating more certainty in the marketplace than currently exists and will help spur economic growth. Mr. Chairman, critics of this legislation will say that we are simply ignoring the Clean Air Act and risking irresponsible harm to our environment. Let me assure my colleagues that this argument is false. The intent of H.R. 2250 is not to completely repeal this environmental rule. The legislation seeks to correct the regulatory overreach by the EPA, especially in this depressed economy, and to reconfigure this rule so that it can be functional for industries and save much needed jobs in the process. So, Mr. Chairman, in closing, I, I, I urge all my colleagues, please support H.R. 2250, and I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Kentucky Reserves. The gentleman from California is recognized. Mr. Chairman, before I yield, I want to uh, set the record straight. Uh, our distinguished colleague on the other side of the aisle said that this bill would provide 15 months to promulgate a rule and then five years to comply. There is 15 months to promulgate the rule, but there is no requirement that there ever be compliance. I want to also point out that uh, this argument about jobs being lost are, are absolutely wrong for four reasons, and four reasons you shouldn't believe them. First, the claims are based on fundamentally flawed studies bought and paid for by the regulated industry. Second, the rules are state. EPA is in the process of redoing them, and not one of these studies has analyzed the actual final rule. Thirdly, EPA has done a rigorous 251-page economic analysis and found that the boiler rules issued in February would be expected to create over 2,000 jobs. And finally, history tells us to be very, very skeptical of industry claims that the sky is falling. EPA is in the process of rewriting these rules. I say to the industry, let us work together to fashion legislation that will solve the immediate problems. One, uh, a legislation, a bill that can be signed by the president, not this bill, which may never see the light of day out of the Senate, and if it did, the President has indicated he would veto it. I now want to yield one minute to a, a member of our committee, gentleman from Georgia, uh, Mr. Barrow. The gentleman is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the ranking member for the time to express another view on the legislation. I'm proud to be an original sponsor of the EPA Regulatory Relief Act. This legislation was drafted in response to new EPA regulations on emissions from industrial boilers. I believe those regulations, however well-meaning, cannot reasonably be met with today's technologies. I believe that this bill is a more reasonable solution than that proposed by the EPA. The choice between us is not between the two mutually exclusive outcomes of dirty air or more jobs. Our challenge is to promote policies that serve both. I think this bill strikes a better balance. It will spur industry 
to make investments that cut down on harmful air emissions while minimizing the chances of negative economic consequences and job losses. I'm proud to have worked in a productive, bipartisan way to get this bill to the floor, and I encourage my colleagues' support. I thank the ranking member for the time, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from Kentucky is recognized. Yes, at this time I would like to yield two minutes to the distinguished gentleman from Texas, Mr. Hall, who is chairman of the uh, Science Committee. The gentleman from Texas is recognized. Uh, Mr. Speaker, Chairman Whitfield, uh, of course I rise in support of H.R. 2250. As policymakers, it's our job to use common sense and judgment to balance the universal priorities of a strong economy, uh, security at home and security abroad, and healthy communities. And this country has a history of remarkable achievement in addressing these priorities. However, with an unemployment rate of more than 9 percent, it's irresponsible for the executive branch to stifle job growth and, for that matter, to create job loss through the outrageous and inflexible negotiations and regulations. In my district alone, the Boiler Mac uh, rules threaten more than 800 good-paying manufacturing jobs. These are not jobs that can be recreated. Once eliminated, they're gone. Several weeks ago, Assistant uh, Administrator Gina McCarthy stated arrogantly, quote, I don't want to create the impression that EPA is in the business of creating jobs, unquote. I feel that statement is inappropriate and unfeeling toward those who have lost their jobs and lost the ability to provide for their families' future. Uh, H.R. 2250 is a clear statement by Congress that EPA slow down and allow for reasoning along with some regulations. The President said that his administration would be the most transparent in history. Instead, we find clandestine models, cherry-picking of data, double-counting of benefits, and a failure to follow basic peer review guidelines. This is a recipe for losing the public's trust. EPA needs a timeout, and this bill provides it. I urge all my colleagues to support this bill, and I yield back my time, and I thank the Chair. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Kentucky Reserves. Yes, General. Can, uh, would you, uh, gentleman from Massachusetts, can, recognized. Can you inform us as to how much time is remaining on, on both sides? The gentleman, from Massachusetts the gentleman from Massachusetts has 11 minutes. The gentleman from Kentucky has 13 and a quarter minutes. Yes, I, I yield uh, five minutes to the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Moran. The gentleman from Virginia is recognized for five minutes. I thank my very good friend. Uh, for yielding to me. Mr. Speaker, a rigorous peer-reviewed analysis called the Benefits and Costs of the Clean Air Act from 1990 to 2020, conducted by the Environmental Protection Agency, found that the air quality improvements under the Clean Air Act will save $2 trillion by 2020 and prevent at least 230,000 deaths annually. 230,000 lives saved on an annual basis. We could save four times the number of people killed each year in automobile accidents by reducing air pollution. Yet just two weeks ago, this chamber approved legislation to block the EPA from implementing rules to clean up the single largest stationary source of air pollution. That legislation gave this nation's oldest and dirtiest coal-fired power plants and other pass to pollute and avoid compliance with the Clean Air Act. Today we're considering legislation, the EPA Regulatory Relief Act, to exempt the second largest source of hazardous air pollution, industrial and commercial boilers, process heaters, and commercial and industrial solid waste incinerators. Under this bill, these large boilers and incinerators would be given at least a 75-month pass from regulation, a 15-month delay before any new rules could be issued, and an additional five years beyond that delay before any new emission standards could be issued, and no deadline for industry compliance. This bill does more than just offer a pass from regulation. It also ensures that any final regulation will be weaker than what the law requires. The final section of this bill implements the Clean Air Act's most protective legal standard for reducing toxic air pollution, the maximum available control technology. After 20 years, we're replacing it with the absolutely least protective of measures called work practice standards, such as equipment tune-ups, 
that need not even reduce emissions. Pass this bill and you sentence hundreds of thousands to asthma attacks and a lifetime of health complications. Pass this bill and you saddle our economy with unnecessary costs and employers with millions of additional sick days. Pass this bill and you trigger an additional 20,000 heart attacks. Pass this bill and you condemn tens of thousands of Americans to a premature death. Mr. Speaker, the Cement Sector Regulatory Relief Act that unfortunately will pass today and the Train Act that passed two weeks ago constitute an all-out war between this nation's dirtiest industries and the federal agency charged with protecting the public's health. EPA has become the symbol, the center of the debate over the role of the government. It's a sad commentary for this chamber that an industry that prefers to invest in the political process rather than in saving lives by reducing harmful emissions is in fact winning the debate. In fact, the coal-consuming industries that have underwritten this assault on EPA were invited early on during the first year of the Obama administration to sit down and craft a, co a compliance option. The administration had hoped to craft a deal similar to the historic deal it made with the nation's auto industry on fuel efficiency and tailpipe emissions. An article by Carol Davenport in the September 22nd issue of the National Journal referenced this meeting. But unlike the auto industry, the coal-consuming industries refused to negotiate. Instead, and let me quote from the article, they, in quotes, banded together with the Republican Party to strategize. And the 2010 midterm elections offered the ba perfect battleground. The companies invested heavily in campaigns to elect Tea Party candidates crusading against the role of big government. Industry groups like the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, Tea Party groups with deep ties to polluters like Americans for Prosperity and so-called super PACs like Carl Rose American Crossroads spent record amounts to help elect the new House Republican majority. My colleagues, this bill presents a false choice. It's one peddled by an industry that refuses to clean up its act. Hundreds of thousands of people owe their lives today to the environmental movement. Leaders in Congress and the White House who pushed for and passed the landmark environmental laws back in the 1970s that required polluters to clean our waters and reduce the pollution in the air we breathe. In the decade after the 1990 Clean Air Act, amendments were signed into law by the first President Bush. And then our unemployment rate declined, our economy grew, and we reduced acid rain forming gases by more than 30%. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, do, you want to, do you have any more time to give? Yeah, I will yield 30 additional.